I'm Dr. Cindy Russell. I uh, am a plastic surgeon. I am interested in this issue. I'm executive director of Physicians for Safe Technology. And um, we're going to talk today about wireless technologies in school, wireless radiation as a toxicant, uh, unique vulnerabilities of children, and just touch on the best practices for safe tech in schools. And the point of this slide is to tell you that it's not only students that we're worried about, but it's everybody who's in a school. It's the teachers, the administrators. You have the janitors that are there, the staff. And now uh, you've also got bus drivers because they're putting wireless uh, in buses now. Digital technology has uh, is a complex risk that you are dealing with when you put digital technology in schools in general. Um, there's distraction, addiction, learning issues, the psychosocial issues of depression, anxiety, ADHD, and even suicide, the commodification of children's data with ed tech, the privacy and security with ed tech. There's eye effects. And what we're going to talk about today is the physical effects. So what I learned a lot about wireless radiation, I learned that wireless radiation passes through bodies and organisms. It's absorbed by anything containing water. It can interfere with and harm cellular biological processes and not through heat. Um, and when we get exposed to wireless radiation, it's not just one frequency. We get a mix of artificial frequencies now and even more all the time as we add wireless devices. And we're electrical beings, our heart, our brain, our nervous system, and our endocrine systems all work through tiny electrochemical um, signals. Uh, so it really makes sense that this wireless radiation would harm us. I learned that there's seven decades of military and basic science harm from radio frequency radiation. It affects all living organisms. It acts as an environmental and human toxicant. The effects are cumulative. And the biological effects that are seen in all of these studies are well below the current safety guidelines. They're just, the safety guidelines are obsolete and not protective of human health or the environment. The variables in EMF exposure uh, are time, distance, location, power density, the frequencies that you're exposed to, the modulation, which is the uh, pulsation um, of the electromagnetic radiation to carry data, uh, are buildings in the way, are trees there, or walls, all these things can affect how much exposure you have. So we start with the electromagnetic spectrum. I'm not going to go over this, but just to point out that this electromagnetic spectrum is divided into ionizing on the right, non-ionizing on the left. We're talking about non-ionizing radiation. Ionizing radiation are your x-rays and your gamma rays. We're talking about microwave radio, all that stuff. We're focused on microwave here. Uh, classroom sources of wireless radiation, you've already seen. They are multiple and they are increasing. And we didn't even put VR up there, virtual reality. Is wireless radiation safe or toxic? That is the big question. Um, we know that toxic exposures affect our health. Uh, we know if we have, uh, we're exposed to air pollution or asbestos or we smoke, we're gonna have a higher risk that we're gonna have cancer. We know that if we expose to arsenic, we might have a higher risk of bladder cancer. We know that this harm from all these toxins that we're exposed to many, many of these are cumulative. They can have synergistic effects with each other. They can affect all organ systems. And the vulnerable populations are pregnant women, children and the elderly. And we also know that genetics and nutrition can affect how that toxin affects our body and how we process it. Children are more vulnerable to toxic exposures. They have very rapid growth and cell division and differentiation. They, the cells migrate all around. And these me metabolic processes are immature until after puberty and actually beyond that. Critical windows of organ development, you can hijack this process with toxic exposures. And for kids, they have a longer life and more acc accumulation of toxic injuries. So you really wanna protect them from toxins of any sort. Uh, the developing brain is the most vulnerable to toxic exposures. It's very complex. There's, it takes decades to identify a neurotoxin um, and there's critical windows of development. What is the biologic mechanism of toxins? It's oxidation. Reactive oxygen species and free radicals are formed when you have air pollution, UV light, chemicals, smoking, all those, when your body gets exposed to them, your body um, tries to um, get rid of it. In this process of, of processing it, your body creates reactive oxygen species. And this is a process of oxidation. Um, this, it's also called reactive oxygen species, free radical formation. And this can damage your DNA, it produces these unstable molecules that damage DNA, they can damage lipids and they can um, damage um, proteins. Is there a biologic mechanism of harm from wireless radiation? The physicist, if you talk to any physicist, they'll say no. 
It doesn't pop an electron out of its orbit, so it can't be harmful. It's not gamma radiation. It's non-ionizing. Biology says, say it, yes, it is. It's oxidation. And um, alluded to earlier, radiofrequency radiation causes biologic damage to these cellular molecules through this oxidative stress and free radical formation. Lots of studies show it. Um, Bioinitiative report reveals 203 of 225. Um, that's about 89% show this effect. DNA damage, lipid peroxidation, and membrane disruption from this oxidative effect. And again, studies showing radiofrequency radiation causes oxidative stress, inflammation, and our modern human diseases. So this is a, I believe, a contributor to our modern diseases. We know children are more vulnerable to wireless radiation because their skulls are thinner. They have a higher content of water in the brain. There's more absorption of radiation. And it goes deeper. And there's a study that shows it can go all the way to the hippocampus, which is our memory center. And again, organ and reproductive systems are not developed and they're more sensitive. Short and long-term health effects, we'll look at these. Short-term electrosensitivity, and that's a phenomenon where individuals experience adverse health effects while using or being in the vicinity of devices emanating electric, magnetic, or electromagnetic fields. And this is important because some people who become electrosensitive, they become sensitive even to the electric stove sometimes. They're very sensitive to electric fields. This research has been done uh, for many decades. As noted previously, in 1971, the Naval Medical Research Institute published their 2,300 studies um, that they did um, uh, Zori uh, Glazer did this, and um, they showed all of these effects, uh, headaches, insomnia, fatigue, restlessness, anxiety, lack of concentration, memory loss, dizziness, irritability, EEG changes, and seizures, and cardiac effects. And these were all seen in these um, service per personnel or studies that they did with regards to this. They've, they've known for many years this has been a problem. NASA did the same thing in 1981. They um, reviewed this literature, the occupational literature and uh, military personnel and showed all of these same symptoms. Um, and they showed 19 neuropsychiatric effects with occupational exposure. And the longer that you're exposed to it, um, the higher the prevalence of these neuropsychiatric symptoms, cumulative exposure. So long-term health effects. We'll start with the brain because the brain, um, wireless radiation acts as a neurotoxin. There are loss of brain cells in the hippocampus. Um, and you know, as we know, the brain is a most sensitive target for uh, wireless radiation. You can lose brain cells in the hippocampus. That's our memory center. Several studies on that. Oxidative stress, as we talked about before. One of the most concerning is a decrease in neurotransmitter levels. Of course, does affect your mood. So lots of studies on those, and that's very concerning, especially with the levels of depression, anxiety, ADHD, and so forth. Uh, could this be the reason? It's these changes in neurotransmitter levels causing these um, neuropsychiatric symptoms. Demyelination um, of, with chronic exposure, and this is a problem because that's our insulation to our nerves. And then our nerves have a lot of cross signaling that um, could be a problem. And in general, there's a lot of evidence for disturbance of the nervous system signaling. Um, Dr. Hugh Taylor did this wonderful study and published this. He's from Yale obstetrician. He wondered if fetal exposure to cell phones could cause uh, any you know, ADH symptoms. So um, they took two groups of uh, pregnant mice and one was the control, no radiation. The other, um, they put a cell phone above the cage and um, radiated this. They, they tested the offspring um, as young adults and they found that the offspring who were exposed to the cell phone radiation had decreased memory, hyperactivity, and no fear. And there was this conclusion that fetal radi radio frequency radiation exposure did cause a neurobehavior uh, uh, behaviors in mice. And if you watch the video um, that was produced by Grassroots Education, um, they it, he just says they were bouncing off the walls. It was so distinct, the two different rats, they had no, they were just bouncing off. They didn't have care in the world. So it was an excellent study. Um, this just shows, um, this is a study on neurotransmitters, that these neurotransmitters may be really explain the cognitive and memory impairment and sleep disorders in those who are exposed to wireless radiation. Um, wireless radiation opens the blood-brain barrier, and even after a couple of hours exposure, the studies show you can have up to eight weeks of the blood-brain barrier being open. And consider this, you know, uh, Salford did these studies for 20 years. He was a really excellent scientist, did a lot of studies. Consider that you have all these exposures to toxins and the blood-brain barrier is supposed to stop those. If that's open, then that then increases all our vulnerability to um, 
to all these other toxins. So as a cofactor, and maybe that could explain some of these toxic effects, uh, increase in toxic effects as well, um, neurocognitive as well as possibly brain cancer. So many studies on memory, behavior, and learning that are quite large. I'm get, just going to go over Forrester. And basically, um, this study was done in Switzerland. 24 secondary schools were looked at, kids in grades 7, 8, 9, and they uh, looked at memory tasks. And they did find that um, there were problems with figural memory um, from radio frequency radiation in the regions most exposed during mobile phone use. And they advised no cell phones to the ears. Cognitive decline near students near cell towers. This is a study by Mayo. He took two schools, one with a higher radiation level from a cell tower, the other with a lower radiation cell level, and, and looked at the kids aged 13 to 16. And he, this was a two-year study. And he found that the higher exposure group had delayed fine and gross motor skills, spatial working memory, and attention disorder. Um, these studies should be done before we put the cell towers on, not after. And this is um, really a, a great study, and we need to do more of it. Cell phone use increases distraction and learning. This just shows you there's a lot of these studies that, you know, note taking is better, learning is better um, without the, without the uh, uh, digital uh, cell phones and so forth. And could this be an effect of um, neurotransmitters or just the addictive nature of phones um, and so forth? So there's, that could be a really a um, confounding factor. DNA damage and cancer. Um, we're going to go over this now. IR classifies radiofrequency radiation as possibly carcinogenic to, to humans. That includes all the Wi-Fi devices, and it really justifies a precautionary approach. We know that DNA damage uh, um, is related to cancer. Oxidative factor is a major factor in DNA um, damage, and our DNA me repair mechanisms are always working. And if we overload them with DNA uh, uh, damage, they won't be able to fix those mutations. Then those mutations. Um, can accumulate and then lead to cancer. And if you have a BRCA gene, that's your DNA repair mechanism, you're gonna be much more likely to get cancer. Lots of studies on wireless radiation and cancer and DNA, DNA damage. Research on DNA damage, Dr. Lai's research on genotoxic toxicity show most of these studies show damage. NTP studies showed clear evidence of cancer and DNA damage. R Ramazani Institute uh, replicated that DNA damage and cancer. Occupational reviews of military personnel by Peleg um, showed this as well, and Markova showed DNA repair problems in stem cells, which is a new mechanism uh, that they believe is related to cancer. The NTP study on long-term exposure uh, done in um, Triangle Park and National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, the gold standard of studies, 10 years, $30 million, robust study. They found clear evidence for heart schwannomas, the same as the epidemiologic studies done by Dr. Hardell, some evidence for glioma in brain tumors, DNA damage. They found out unusually that there was cardiomyopathy and aging of the heart of this. Um, in addition, they found that there was increases in tumors and several other organs that were higher compared to controls. And the controls had very low uh, cancer rates. The Ramazani Institute replicated that study and showed the same thing uh, in much lower doses than the NTP study. Cell towers, just briefly mentioned, Balmori Bel reviewed 38 studies, 77% showed an increase in cancer near cell, near, near cell towers, and you can review these. And again, these are within about 500 meters or about 1,500 feet. Exposure of Wi-Fi in schools, you have these Wi-Fi routers. There's a whole set of uh, studies on our website that show Wi-Fi radiation effects from this. FCC standards are outdated. They're only based on heat, not biological effects. They need reevaluating. The American Academy of Pediatrics advises that as well. We need biologically based exposure limits. We need to put wires back in and reinvent those landlines, safer, faster, more secure. We need to reduce our exposure to wireless bands, uh, cell phone use at school and ban cell towers near schools. Um, these recommendations to reduce EMR exposures, the Council of Resolution of 1815, the German parliament, German schools don't use wireless Glad reform, High Performing Schools, Maryland's Children Environmental Health Protection, New Jersey Education Association, and most recently the Santa Clara County Medical Association Best Practices for Safe Technology is fairly comprehensive on this. These are some articles I've written. I want to thank you so much for your time. And this is our motto is our vision is a world where technology serves our needs without undermining our physical, psychosocial, or environmental health. Thank you so much.